Hello everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Michael, and uh, um, I'm sorry I can't be here. You know, I really want to be uh, be in this meeting person, but um, it's not meant to be. Anyway, so um, the the title of my talk is running JavaScript, Python, and Ruby in WebAssembly. So essentially, running scripting language in WebAssembly, right? You know, so since we are the a technical audience, so I would just cut to the chase, right? You know, uh, hard started. You know, WebAssembly was originally designed not to be a scripting language runtime, right? You know, it's uh, uh, because we were unsatisfied with JavaScript performance. We want to run C, C++ code, Rust code, and uh, compiled language code, you know, those um, with close native performance, right? You know, um, those applications alongside um, JavaScript, you know, so that JavaScript applications can take advantage of that. To, so it's meant as a supplement to JavaScript. So as such, inside the browser, the WebAssembly runtime runs side by side with JavaScript, right? You know, so you have a you have a JavaScript runtime and WebAssembly runtime. There is a bridge between them, and if you are writing Rust applications and compiling to WebAssembly, you would have something called the Wasm Bijet. And uh, if you are running compiling C applications, it would be something else. So essentially, there would be a WebAssembly runtime with a bridge that goes to JavaScript. The JavaScript runtime acts as a host for the WebAssembly runtime, meaning the WebAssembly runtime would just run the computation, but uh, the the data, the, the networking data file system, and all that were provided by the JavaScript runtime and uh, made available to the WebAssembly application through the bridge. Right? You know, so that's the original design. You know, so the original design of WebAssembly really is to run compiled applications, it's not to run. A, um, a, Java, a scripting language application like JavaScript, right? you know. So, what has changed? So, how it's going? You know, why are we talking about WebAssembly running? Um, you know, JavaScript running inside WebAssembly now. Well, before we get to why, you know, let's see you know, how it's done. You know, that's because again we are technical audience here, right? You know, so strictly speaking, uh, it can be done, right? You know, because as um, we just talked about, WebAssembly runs. Uh, applications compiled from C, C++ and Rust, and then you know, um, although in the, in the browser it's typically run side by side with JavaScript, right? But you know, what is written in C, C++ or Rust? Practical, practically everything, right? Including all the JavaScript, uh, a lot of those JavaScript runtimes interpreters, Python runtime interpreters, Ruby runtime interpreters. Those are all written in C, C++ or Rust. So they can be compiled into WebAssembly. Once you compile those into WebAssembly, you would have a WebAssembly application that then you can feed the JavaScript source code, Python source code, or Ruby source code to run them inside WebAssembly. So to run web to run JavaScript inside WebAssembly, you do a nested architecture. You know, so you have a WebAssembly runtime on the outer shell, and uh, it has a compiled uh, JavaScript runtime or Python runtime, whatever, what have you. In inside it, and uh, as a WebAssembly application, and then you have um, you know different API modules to provide access, you know, like networking or, or you know we're going to talk about those later. But then the scripting language application itself is feed into the WebAssembly application and get executed there, right? You know, so that's the overall architecture. So we know it can be done. And a lot of the content in this talk is um, you know we have that. Uh, our, our website, so the example applications and all that. So, um, you know, so if you miss any, you um, you know, don't worry. That's um, you know, all the source codes available. And so, you know, we know it can be done, but why? You know, that's uh, why do you need to run um, scripting language applications such as JavaScript, Python, and Ruby inside of WebAssembly? So, the reason really is because WebAssembly is growing in popularity. You know, people are. You know, because although it's start from the use case where the native um, compiled native applications run inside the browser, it's now on the server side, on the edge, on mobile devices, on a lot of places, and people wants to, um, you know, um, the the traditional C plus plus developers or Rust developers are using WebAssembly, but new developers also want to use WebAssembly, and a lot of those new developers want to use JavaScript and Python. You know, so there has been increasing need. I think in the last um, maybe two years, that's uh, we have heard a lot from our customers, from our community. You know, um, uh, how you know how they want to use JavaScript and Python 
and Ruby to, le to a lesser extent in WebAssembly because simply because those are very popular languages. A lot of people know them, a lot of people know knows, you know, um, to write, especially to write simple embedded functions. That's uh, that's that, that are ideally suited for WebAssembly. So next, let, let's look at some use cases of WebAssembly to understand why the scripting languages are so important. So here are some use cases. You know, we we touched on them casually just uh, you know uh, uh, just now. So uh, the first, of course, you know, um, is what WebAssembly has been um, been very successful is to extend existing applications with user-defined functions. You know, so um, you have applications that written in um, any number of languages, you know, Rust, C, Java, you know, whatever. And uh, then you want to turn your software into a platform, into a pass, right? You know, by allowing your users or other people to customize it by adding their own functions to your software, right? You know, essentially turning your, um, you know, this is what we call application serverless, right? You know, that's, uh, um, you know, adding some, so for the user to add serverless functions or user-defined functions into your application and uh, to customize it to do the job that they want, right? You know, so um, in that case, the user, um, the application itself may be written in, say, Rust or Go, you know, whatever, but, uh, um, but the extension functions or the serverless functions is oftentimes written in a, in a language that is low-code. So, you know, JavaScript and Python are I would say, you know, um, are fairly popular languages that people want to use for this particular use case, right? And then there's um, cloud, uh, edge cloud use cases. I mean, you know, that's, uh, you know, um, for instance, the, 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 the compute node on, on CDN networks or, um, you know, uh, 5, 5 GMECs, you know, those are um, data centers um, on the edge that outside of the uh, cloud, big cloud data centers that are closer to the, uh, to the end users. And, you know, so there are a number of um, application use cases there. So for instance, there's uh, isomorphic rendering, you know, so meaning the server-side rendering of React or server-side rendering of popular JavaScript frameworks. You know, today, you know, those are, um, uh, those are rendered inside, say, um, uh, Node.js or, um, Node or Dnode running inside Docker, right, you know, or inside a VM. And is there a way to run those JavaScripts in a, in a lightweight environment such as WebAssembly? And there's AI inference, right? You know, so you have um, um, you know pictures or other data captured by edge devices, and uh, it's be uneconomical to send it all all the way back to the to the cloud data center to process them, and we can process them right on the edge in the edge cloud, and uh, um, you know and have the results stored there or have you know generate actions from there and you know things like that. And then there's edge devices. There's edge devices use cases. You know, WebAssembly because WebAssembly is a lightweight runtime, so it can run on mobile devices as a cross-platform runtime, uh, essentially replacing the JVM in a lot of cases. So you can uh, you can embed a WebAssembly runtime inside a mobile application, like uh, like uh, Amazon has done with Amazon Prime Video. You know, that's so uh, they have a the, the, the video player they have um, needs to run um, you know C C based. Um, you, you know applica uh, applications, and in order to um, simplify the the work to port the the to run the uh, C based applications across um, you know according to their blog over eight thousand different devices types you know uh, all kinds of Android devices and, and iOS and you know things like that and so they need uh, they need the middle layer that that provide cross platform compatibility and WebAssembly the uh, with the ability to um, you know, WebAssembly would be you know one of the ideal you, uh, you know runtimes for this purpose, right? So, but yeah, but in this case, WebAssembly not should not only be able to run say C or Rust um, compiled native code, but can, uh, should also be able to run um, say um, you know JavaScript and Python and things like that. And then um, last, you know, there's uh, um, you know um, th th there's um, a very big set of use cases that we have seen, uh, we are probably seeing today from from this um, from the cloud native wasm day, is that um, you know a very interesting use case of, of WebAssembly is to use it as a standalone um, container, you know, directly managed by Kubernetes, right? You know, so you could have a um, you could have a service mesh that has um, you know Docker based or Linux based services. And, uh, but also have WebAssembly based services, and uh, in, and in this case, you know, there's uh, um, um, 
you know, for a lot of computing tasks, we especially embedded computing tasks, um, you know, dark um, Linux containers could be too heavyweight. And uh, um, so, you know, we, we want to write the service, we want to write the microservices in WebAssembly. And, uh, in, uh, and in this case, you know, uh, Java, JavaScript and the Python both provide very, um, you know, compelling, um, you know, um, um, service frameworks for uh, you know for running those microservices. So those are uh, so those are the reasons why you know the use cases. Uh, why do you want to run JavaScript or Python inside WebAssembly? So um, for today's talk, you know we're gonna spend um, perhaps um, you know um, most of the time talk about JavaScript. You know because that's like we said, this is one. Um, this is this is the most important use case, and we're going to talk about Python and Ruby at the end of this talk. So the way to run JavaScript inside WebAssembly, like I've just said, is to take a C C plus plus based JavaScript um, an interpreter or JavaScript runtime engine, and compile it into WebAssembly run, uh, into WebAssembly bytecode and run it as a WebAssembly application, right? You know, so um, this is work that that people have done. You know, that's well, we have done this as well. But um, you know, um, the community, you know, um, you know, have have supported one of the you know most lightweight and quickest um, you know JavaScript um, interpreter called QuickJS um, into WebAssembly. So um, as you can see the example here, it's uh, by leveraging the WebAssembly uh, WASI standard, meaning that um, you know uh, to have um, this uh, QuickJS runtime running inside the uh, WebAssembly runtime in this particular case, the was Manage runtime. It would have access to the operating system. It would have access to the um, to the command line argument, for instance, and it would have access to the local directory. So it would be able to read files and read from the command line. You know, and uh, you know, basically run a very standard um, um, JavaScript. So it can essentially you can put any um, JavaScript content here and it'd be able to run it, right? You know, so that's um, you know that's. The basic stuff, you know, that's uh, to have um, uh, to have a quick JS runtime compiled into WebAssembly to run any pure JavaScript content. And with this, with quick JS, um, it's um, you know um, it's fairly easy to have you know uh, ES6 module, you know. So meaning that's um, now we can um, you know with um, with a quick JS runtime inside WebAssembly, you know, inside say was Match. It can have access to the operating system, so it can read multiple JS files, right? You know, so you can now have, um, you know, um, ES6 syntax to, um, you know, to export and import functions across different files. You know, so here is example. You know, so at the top panel, you have a uh, you have an exported function called hello, and uh, then you have uh, on the top panel on the uh, on the other side you have an asynchronously exported function and also uh, uh, a variable a string, right? And then you know uh, in the middle panel you have the um, you know the the, the the JavaScript application that imports the um, you know the ES6 modules because the imports was imported from the file system, so it's a, it could be an asynchronous operation. It could also be a, a, a asynchronous operation, right? You know, so it depends on the 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 um, the syntax flavor that you want to use. You could do it asynchronously or synchronously, and so well, both are fine. And, and we want to demonstrate both use cases. And then you know, using the uh, QuickJS runtime, you can uh, you can load this and run it inside WebAssembly, and you can see the results here. You know, that's uh, you know. Um, um, uh, it would be able to execute. It would be able to import those functions from those modules and execute them. Right? You know, so that's a very simple example of you know um, how to run uh, ES6 modules inside web um, in, inside WebAssembly. And uh, um, the um, so ES6 module is uh, is uh, is a relatively new standard for JavaScript. Um, so, um, for a lot of older JavaScripts, um, you know, especially the ones that in the in the Node.js ecosystem. Um, we are still using the, the common JS module, the CJS module. You know, to um, there's lots of JavaScript libraries are written that way. So in order to use CJS, we have a, a, we use another tool called um, uh, called Rollup. So you know that's essentially you know there's a, um, you use Rollup.js to um, to package a, a JavaScript application that imports those npm modules. Into a single file, you know that's essentially it's it takes down all the uh, it's it's pulls down all those 
um, uh, module files from from npm repository, and then combine them into a big file, and then you know you can use web you can use the web, uh, the QuickJS environment inside WebAssembly to run the entire file, right? You know, so that's um, you know, so we also have a demonstration here. You know, that's basically it takes the uh, um, uh, you know uh, the um, digital signature module and then computes MD5, and it's also uh, that's one uh, you know takes one of the math libraries and computes that. So, you know, so those are, so, you know, uh, through rollup.js, we can also support, um, uh, you know, uh, a common JS modules and a large part of the uh, NPM ecosystem. A lot of NPM modules can be supported this way. But if that's, you know, if we just support ES6 and, C, uh, and CJS, there will be, you know, it'll be interesting, but um, um, perhaps not yet compelling. And what I find most compelling that adds new features to um, you know to running JavaScript inside WebAssembly is really to um, is to allow um, Rust-based implementations and WebAssembly and, and, and JavaScript to interact with each other. Meaning that uh, you know you could have uh, you could write a function in Rust and then expose this function as a JavaScript API. So as a so as a JavaScript developer, they would not need to know. The Rust implementation behind it, that we just need to call the API. So, in, so um, a lot of this API is provided by um, by QuickJS itself, and uh, and our Rust wrappers around QuickJS, right? You know, so um, on on the left side, you can see there's a there's a there's a Rust function that is um, um, you know designed to interact with JavaScript. So it has um, constructs like the JS function and JS value and you know things like that. And then on the um, on the right side. Is that we um, we when we compile the um, the QuickJS runtime, we now have hooks to import this function. This function is a struct called clone fn, right? And give it name, you know, in the context, give it name called hi. So the, uh, so then we run a JavaScript, um, um, you know. Then in the JavaScript, we can simply refer this function as hi, right? You know, so the 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 JavaScript code is um, um, you know is is on the right panel. It's code equals to high one two three, right? You know that's uh, so meaning in JavaScript we just call high one two three, and uh, the JavaScript interpreter sees the symbol, knows it's a building function that it can find its implementation in Rust. So it goes to Rust to find this implementation and execute this function, and then give you the result, right? You know so the um, you know um, on the right you can also see the the. Um, the result from this, so you know, um, oh, why do we do that? The way, the the reason to do that is that you know, um, so for the um, for a lot of tasks that pure JavaScript is kind of slow or it's difficult to do, you know, so the ability to have the ability to use um, to write those uh, tasks in Rust and then have the whole thing compiled into WebAssembly allows us to mix the ease of use of JavaScript and the high performance of Rust, right? You know, that's really take advantage of. Uh, WebAssembly's capability to run both, right? You know, to be able to run, um, you know, Rust compiled applications and also uh, JavaScript uh, applications as interpreter, right? You know, so I think this is uh, one of the, um, uh, you know, uh, compelling cases of why you want to, uh, you want to run JavaScript inside WebAssembly because you could potentially run it faster and safer. Right? So, with that in mind, you know, so um, we, um, you know, I want to introduce you to some some of the um, um, you know, uh, Rust APIs that we, we have already built with our, um, you know, um, because I work at, you know, I'm the maintainer at, at, um, at Wasm Edge, you know, so at Wasm Edge we have um, some Rust extensions, SDK extensions to WebAssembly, you know, that's, uh, so we build some of the functionalities um, as JavaScript APIs using the approach that I have just mentioned, right, you know, so um, for instance here, that's, uh, um, you know, uh, as we know, um, a, a networking socket has been a long a missing feature from WASI, but at Wasm Edge we added our own non-blocking asynchronous networking, um, you know, um, socket support, right? And we have a Rust SDK for that. So in our QuickJS implementation, we have in our QuickJS um, setup, we have a, we have a, a Rust module that implements a HTTP module inside JavaScript. So meaning that when running QuickJS inside Wasm Edge, you could write JavaScript. That uh, that does HTTP request and does HTTP and become HTTP server as well, as um, because HTTP server could be asynchronous, meaning that it's non-blocking, right? You know, it can handle um, multiple concurrent, um, you know, um, uh, connections at the same time from the same port 
um, you know, using the same thread, right? You know, so so there's uh, so by incorporating a Rust-based I/O library that Wasmage has provided for well, for its WebAssembly implementation, we would be able to support you know networking-based Java -based, uh, JavaScript applications in Wasmage just using the um, the 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 techniques I have just mentioned, right? That along the same line of thought, you can uh, we can do the fetch API, right? You know, uh, we can do HTTP um, because we can we can do simple HTTP request and and the HTTP server, so we can do the fetch. Um, you know, that's uh, we're going to talk about the significance of this API in a, in, in, in a couple of slides, and you can also do the um, you know um, one of the interesting features of Wasm Edge is it provides. Uh, extension for TensorFlow, so it also have Wasi uh, NN extension for OpenMiner. You know, meaning that's um, you know um, 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 you can use Rust to write uh, AI inference applications and have them compiled into WebAssembly and runs inside Wasmage. It would know uh, to use the GPU or to use other um, you know um, um, hardware or software components available on the device to do the AI inference. And uh, because this is a Rust API. For that extension, we can also incorporate that into JavaScript API using the technique we have just mentioned, right? So here is a um, is an example of JavaScript application that you can run inside uh, inside Wasmage to take advantage of the um, the the TensorFlow extension. So now we have talked about you know that's uh, we have we have networking, we can have you know those um, those. Those native functions in inside the WebAssembly. So one of the uh, when we combine those together, one of the uh, more interesting thing that we can do on Wasm Edge is really to do uh, server side rendering for um, for for React applications. So in React 18, there's a, there's a, um, a way to do server side rendering called Streaming SSR, and uh, the way it works is to fetch the data from the um, from other servers first, build the model and render HTML, and then send the HTML across the wire to the to the browser to do um, and then be rendered as uh, uh, as a UI in the browser, right? You know, so um, this whole generating the HTML uh, DOM components and the rendered content into it, um, you know, can all be done on the on the edge server, you know, um, um, inside the WebAssembly runtime now. So in the past, you know, you have to have Node.js or Dino, and then have them wrapped inside a Docker container to do that. You know, now we have, you know, um, now we have a WebAssembly runtime that is that is much much faster, um, that is much much smaller, and almost as fast. Right? So there's a um, there's a um, uh, example website and tutorials that you can uh, you can try try on your own. You know, so you can take a React 18 application and make little changes. To um, how the SSR server is run, because you are not no longer using Node.js, you are using um, you know um, the non-blocking socket in Wasm Edge. So there's um, there's a tiny bit of the code changes there, and once you do that, you know you would be able to uh, you would be able to launch it and run it on the uh, you know uh, on your Edge server. Yeah. So you know now you know one of the common questions I get is uh, you know when you're choosing QuickJS. You know how does that compare with V8? You know that's because V8 uh, behind Node.js and Dino as the high-performance JavaScript engine. Can you be as fast as um, V8? The answer is no. QuickJS is the interpreter. It's uh, it doesn't have GIT, so it's much slower than V8. However, as we said, you know um, one of the things is that a lot of those uh, bottlenecks, like you know, a huge time-consuming um, you know tasks like generating strings. You know AI inference and you know seeing a network uh, concurrent networking and all that stuff, it can be done in Rust. You know, so you don't have to do that in, in in JavaScript. In that case, you know the overall performance of application may not necessarily be much slower. You know, this, of course, the true benefit of using QuickJS and WebAssembly is that it's much much smaller. So V8 is like 40 megabytes in memory, but uh, uh, QuickJS is like less than one megabyte. So uh, even adding WebAssembly, it's still much smaller than say. You know, um, um, V8 inside Docker, right? You know, and uh, um, QuickJS in WebAssembly is also safer because um, um, the WebAssembly runtime itself is a security sandbox, and uh, it has much smaller attack surface for uh, you know for security issues, and it's also more manageable. You know, uh, because WebAssembly runtime itself is uh, is OCI container, it can be managed by Kubernetes, and uh, the same. Uh, you know, in order for V8 to do that, you have to wrap it around in in a, in a Linux container, which make it much much bigger and heavier, right? 
you know, so of course there's other approaches to run JavaScript inside um, uh, inside WebAssembly. You know, um, one of the leading uh, exam uh, um, uh, alternative is, uh, is SpiderMonkey. You know, that's uh, the JavaScript engine, the, the JIT JavaScript engine that's used in uh, in Firefox. So there's uh, articles um, and, and and also code on how to do that. And uh, then there's uh, uh, Shopify has a project called Javi, and it's also a set of Rust wrappers and the tools around QuickJS that Shopify has developed, you know, that's, uh, um, that allows, um, you know, um, a pretty much, uh, it's, it's a similar approach that, uh, than the one that, that, I've just, uh, that, I've just, that I've just described, so check it out. So the other way to do it is really to um, incorporate V8 into WebAssembly using V8 as a host function, you know, meaning that you pass JavaScript evaluation directly into V8. But that's something, you know, that's something that we are experimenting with. And, you know, if you are interested, you know, we, we, we could talk more after this talk. Yeah, so, you know, that's the thing, uh, thing about WebAssembly. Now we have a couple minutes left, so we want to talk a little bit about Python and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and Ruby as well. So for Python, you know, um, so for JavaScript, we took a JavaScript interpreter and compiled it into WebAssembly. We can do the same thing for Python. So Python, there's a, a, a Python interpreter written in Rust, right? You know, it's called Rust Python. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so um, you can take that project. You can take that project and compile into WebAssembly, into WASI, you know, using, use your favorite, use your, you know, Rust compiler to do that. And then you can just run, um, you know, um, a Python command shell. You know, you can run any pure Python applications in there, right? Um, however, you know, that's, uh, um, um, you know, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done because uh, most of the Python applications out there are not pure Python applications. Those are Python wrappers around C applications. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty much, you know, uh, the same approach that we have just described, right? You know, we have JavaScript applications wrapped around Rust applications, right? You know, so they cannot simply be interpreted by Rust Python because they have native libraries. And uh, um, however, those C libraries could potentially be compiled into WebAssembly as well, you know, using the same approach that we have just described with JavaScript. So this um, is pretty much, uh, uh, you know, a, a very exciting area that's, that's um, you know, I think people should be working on. You know, of course, there's, um, um, you know, um, because the, the, the networking acts, um, uh, socket support in WAS is lacking. So um, we can't quite do Python networking applications yet. We have to incorporate, if we want to run the WAS match, we have to do, uh, we, ha we can incorporate the WAS match socket API into Python and, um, and then support uh, Python frameworks like FastAPI to turn that into a microservice framework, right? You know, so, so there are things like that. You know, so, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a still pretty much a work in progress and we'd love to uh, collect collaborate with the community. Then there's a, another interesting approach is just to, to compile Python to C, right? You know, turn the Python code into C code and then turn C code into WebAssembly and run inside WebAssembly runtime. So that is another, um, you know, um, uh, interesting approach. People have been trying that, but, uh, you know, um, we can also see some roadblocks because, you know, primarily because um, you know, not all C APIs are supported in WASI. So you're gonna find something that things that are missing, and um, um, you know, so basically you may, your, your, your mileage may vary uh, using this approach. And then um, one of the exciting, um, you know, happenings last year was um, the Ruby team, the C Ruby team has figured out how to compile the C-based Ruby interpreter into WebAssembly. So they even provide a very simple tool for that, you know, so from their repository, you can just uh, you know, compile, you can compile that and run that in was match and you would be able to, you know, run Ruby, pure Ruby applications that way. Uh, of course, you know, that's, uh, um, that's um, you know, Ruby has more language features than WebAssembly can support. For instance, it has threads, it has uh, operating system processes and, you know, things like that. So all those things has to, um, has to be, um, you know, uh, worked out before this can, can be, um, it can be a generic Ruby runtime. Right? So, yeah, that's, uh, um, you know, um, I, you know, we have gone very quick overview of you know um, of scripting language support in WebAssembly using WASMH as an example. You know, that's uh, um, and uh, um, like I said, JavaScript is probably the most um, is the one that has most application, but uh, and also the one has the most mature support. And uh, um, and but Python are 
getting there. You know, I think because there's lots of Python developers and lots of people are interested in that. And there's a clear roadmap of you know adding more features to both JavaScript and Python. You know, uh, to have them run better um, um, in WebAssembly, right? You know, and uh, um, Ruby is not far behind as well. So you know, um, I think um, you know, hopefully by by this time next year, by the Cloud Wasm Day next year, that we would be able to see um, a whole slew of you know um, um, uh, scripting language applications running inside WebAssembly, either running inside as serverless functions or as extensions to other platforms. You know, so um, thank you very much. So um, I think that's that's all the time I have. Um, so um, come check out Wasm Edge, and um, I'll talk to you later. Thanks.